Hi students, picking up where I left off with chapter 2, we have covalent bonds. So a covalent bond forms when two atoms share one or more pairs of outer shell electrons. So as an example here, we have hydrogen gas. The molecular formula is simply H2 because it is two um, atoms of hydrogen joined together. The electron configuration shows that both of those atoms are sharing a pair of electrons so that they both have a complete outer shell. The structural formula here, the line just signifies that there's a single bond, which is a single pair of shared electrons. And then we have space filling and ball and stick models as well. So you can see with these various other examples, that there might be single bonds, in which case one atom shares a pair of electrons with another atom, and there can also be double bonds, in which case with oxygen gas, um, these two oxygen atoms are sharing two pairs of electrons. Hydrogen bonds are weak bonds that form between water molecules and we will come back to these when we discuss the properties of water. Cells are constantly rearranging molecules by breaking existing chemical bonds and forming new ones. So a great example of this is when we chew food and use chemical digestion in our stomachs. Um, we are breaking down um, existing chemical bonds in those foods we're eating, and then our bodies are going to use those elements. They're going to be rearranged into our own molecules um, to support normal functioning cells. So any sort of change in the chemical composition of matter is called a chemical reaction. So for example here, in this equation we have hydrogen gas joining with oxygen gas, Together, those are the reactants. This arrow signifies that a reaction is occurring. And then on the other side of it, we have our products. In this case, it's simply water. So those hydrogen atoms have joined with a single bond to the oxygen atoms, and we end up with two water molecules. Um, I'm not going to be asking you to balance chemical equations or any of that. I'm going to leave that up to your chemistry instructors, um, but just know that any change in a chemical composition of matter is going to be known as a chemical reaction. Chemical reactions can be symbolized with equations, which I just touched on in the previous slide. So on the left side of the equation are the reactants, which are the starting materials. And on the right side of the equation are the products, which are the end materials. And it's important to note, and I'm sure you've heard of this before, but chemical reactions cannot create or destroy matter. They only rearrange it. So while leaves may decompose, that matter within those leaf cells are just being converted to other forms, or being broken down and converted to soil, or they're being consumed by decomposers, that matter isn't being destroyed, it's just basically shifting form. All right, so changing gears a little bit, we're going to talk about the importance of water for life on Earth. Life on Earth began in water and evolved there for three billion years. And modern life is still intimately tied to water. Our own cells are composed of 70% to 95% water, depending on what type of cell it is. The abundance of water is a major reason Earth is habitable. Um, you've probably heard of the search for extraterrestrial life. It sounds much more exciting than it often is in reality. Um, what most people are looking for when they're looking for life is simply liquid water. Um, if there's liquid water, life as we know it 
um, may be there as well. So when you look at water in isolation, the water molecule is deceptively simple, especially when we have a ball and stick model like this. It's just two hydrogen atoms joined to one oxygen atom by single covalent bonds. Remember, covalent bonds are where atoms are sharing electrons. However, the electrons of the covalent bonds are not shared equally between oxygen and hydrogen. This unequal sharing makes water a polar molecule. So oxygen here, it's a bigger molecule. They have a little bit more weight in this compound, um, and they are going to have an unequal share of the electrons. This creates a somewhat positive charge on the hydrogen end and a somewhat negative charge on the oxygen end. Because remember, electrons are negatively charged. So there's going to be a bit more of a negative pull um, towards that oxygen atom. The polarity of water results in weak electrical attractions between neighboring water molecules. Remember that phrase again, opposites attract. We're going to have oxygen atoms of a neighboring water molecule having a slight negative charge, and hydrogen atoms of a water molecule having a slight positive charge. That is going to create a hydrogen bond here between these neighboring water molecules. So these interactions are simply called hydrogen bonds. The polarity of water molecules and the hydrogen bonding that results explain most of water's life-supporting properties. And those properties are water's cohesive nature, water's ability to moderate temperature, floating ice, and the versatility of water as a solvent. So when I say cohesion of water, I just mean that water molecules tend to stick together. Water molecules stick together as a result of those hydrogen bonds. This is called cohesion, and cohesion is vital for water transport in plants. So when we think about large plants like trees having to move streams of water against gravity, um, we really want to be thinking about how those water molecules are held together, and that's due to cohesion. So trees will have these microscopic tubes within their vascular tissue, which is going to be a conduit for water molecules, and because water molecules tend to stick together, they have those attractions between molecules, it's going to make it much easier for plants to basically suck that water up through those microscopic tubes. Surface tension is the measure of how difficult it is to stretch or break the surface of a liquid and hydrogen bonds are what give water an unusually high surface tension, which is taken advantage of by these bugs called water striders. They are um, predatory bugs, so they'll take smaller insects and other true bugs from the surface of the water, and they basically are able to just glide across that surface of water. Okay, so because of hydrogen bonding, water has a strong resistance to temperature change. Heat and temperature are related, but they're not quite the same. So heat is the amount of energy associated with the movement of the atoms and molecules in a body of matter, and temperature measures the intensity of that heat. So it's the average speed of molecules rather than the total amount of heat energy in a body of matter. Water can absorb and store large amounts of heat while only changing a few degrees in temperature. And this is because heat 
breaks up the hydrogen bonds first, and then it actually raises the temperature of the water. So a lot of energy goes into breaking the attraction between water molecules, um, rather than actually raising the temperature of the water itself. So you're probably all familiar with how um, coastal areas are a little bit more temperate. They don't generally tend to see extreme heat waves, and that's because um, a lot of coastal areas are somewhat protected by the large bodies of water by them. That body of water can absorb a lot of heat, and because that heat is absorbed, it's not going into changing the temperature in the air nearby. So again, Earth's giant water supply causes temperatures to stay within limits that permit life. Of course, this is being challenged through global climate change, um, which we'll probably touch on a bit more as we talk about how biology relates to society um, in further chapters. And we're also familiar with how sweating cools us off. Um, so we have evaporative cooling mechanisms that removes heat not only from ourselves during physical activity, um, but from the Earth itself. Okay, another important property of water is the fact that ice floats. When water molecules get cold, they move apart, which forms ice. And another way of saying that is water expands as it freezes. A chunk of ice has fewer molecules than an equal volume of liquid water. So the density of ice is lower than that of liquid water, and that's why ice floats. If we have a glass of ice water here, if we were to examine the structure of that ice cube, you would see that the space between water molecules is a lot greater than the space between water molecules in the liquid water. So hydrogen bonding occurs um, constantly with water, whereas with ice we have stable hydrogen bonds. Because ice floats, larger bodies of water do not freeze solid, and marine life could not survive if bodies of water froze solid. Yet another property of life or property of water that permits life on Earth is the fact that it's a great solvent. So a solution is a liquid that consists of two or more substances that are evenly mixed. The dissolving agent is called the solvent. You may be familiar with this term. Um, many household products have solvent-based cleaners in them, and the dissolved substance is called the solute. So if you pour a teaspoon of salt into a glass of water, you're going to have a dissociation occurring. Um, the sodium atoms are going to dissociate and become ions in solution. They're going to be surrounded by water molecules rather than by other salt crystals. When water is the solvent, the result is called an aqueous solution. So some examples of that are plant sap. Many plants have this milky sap and it's actually primarily composed of water, but there are dissolved solutes within that water. And then our own red blood cells uh, would also be an aqueous solution. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop here, and I will pick up with the last few slides in the next segment.